Hi, hello. Welcome to the episode of Isaiah's Newsstand. It's your host, Isaiah Edwards. The date is February the 12th, 2024. Hopefully this episode finds you well in good spirits and high hopes. As for me, I'm doing pretty good. Hopefully you've had a good Monday. Hopefully you got that lasagna. As for me, I would say it's been good. Uh, really no complaints, which you know I love to love to say. Hopefully love to hear. Uh, the food corner yesterday was pretty interesting, almost scran like, but uh, I made the Korean style chicken because of the grocery store. They had a, a little bit of a bogo deal where it's like, hey, you can buy two of these boxes and it's free. One's free. <laughs> I'm like, okay, free is me. You had me. So I got um, the garlic chicken. I had the garlic chicken on deck last night with some rice, but uh, here's where it gets a little weird. Like I had saw my, I have a friend, they went to New York and they had, they, you know, they post other food pictures, you know, and um, I see this picture of this bagel sandwich that they had. It looked so good. It had so much good shit on it. Um, but my main takeaways on it were, were I need some cream cheese. I need some tomato and I need some capers and I'm going to make at least a bagel sandwich. And then by the time I got to dinner time, I'm like, I'm going to make a bagel sandwich and then just a normal, you know, wheat toast situation. And I got to say, I made one of my favorite new, new favorite sandwiches. That's for sure. And I think it's just one of those things where I just stuck to the adage of like saying, I'm just going to pile on here. Like, let's just make like a Scooby-Doo style situation. Uh, I will say I tried to limit the meat because I realized I was being like the biggest fatty. And I feel like the scale totally just agreed with me today. So bummer time on that. But uh, it was worth it. It was good. I just had such a good meal with just literally two sandwiches, some chicken and some rice. And I, I just I love that. It was so random. It was so chaotic. But um. I mean, that's being on a plate, is it not? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that really catches you up on all the Joneses. Uh, you know, it, hopefully you listen to, you know, all the shit this weekend. Um, I feel like it was a banger of a weekend podcasting-wise for me. So uh, definitely run that back if you haven't. Uh, let me go ahead and do my startup, and um, then we'll get into some news. Oh, yeah. Okie dokie. Our first story um, comes from CNN. Israeli forces rescue two hostages as airstrikes kill around 100 Palestinians in Rafah. Two Israeli Argentinian men taken ha- taken captive by Hamas on October 7th were rescued on Monday in an early morning raid in which the Israeli military carried out airstrikes that local officials said killed around 100 people in the southern Gaza city of Rafa. The hostages, 60-year-old Fernando Simon Marmon and 70-year-old Louis Har, who I have pictured in the thumbnail, has spent 128 days in captivity. Both men are in relatively good condition and have since reunited with their families. So, I mean, that's kind of the the good news, the good takeaway here. Um, I mean, I do have to add that, um, I mean, yes, this is good. That's two men. There's two, I mean, there's two hostages that, you know, have been going through, you know, a unique kind of hell being that like a whole war is going on around you. And I mean, you don't know if you're going to fucking die, you know? So that's great. But back to that war at hand, um, a highlighted portion that I wanted to read the Palestinian red Crescent society or the PRCS said that more than a hundred people were killed in strikes in Rafa overnight. While the Hamas controlled health ministry in Gaza said 94 people lost their lives neither group specified how many people or how many of those who died were militants Uh, honestly that does not matter we know good and damn well that that wasn't a hundred fucking militants that were killed um that being said i i mean a story that really fucked me up uh today i was listening to the bbc where a man is talking about like literally you know i wake up or you know I, i wake up and then i find 
12 of my family is dead. There's a story that they have here where a girl is going to the bathroom, and in the process of that, her whole family, her home is just on fire, wiped out. So, I mean, you have to ask yourself, is this kind of, is this kind of trade-off worth it? To me, no, especially, a fucking especially when we can have a situation where, where both sides sit down and actually negotiate a peaceful fucking solution. It's so, it's just right there. They're literally been trying to do this shit and then you more or less just hear Israel saying, no, we don't want to comply. Now, I know the spin is to say like, well, no, it's actually Hamas who's not really being compliant. But it's like, because at the end of the day, they were they offered, hey, you do a ceasefire deal. We do the trades of the, of the, the hostages and the prisoners that you have. There we go. This is at least something. And then they were even talked down to saying, can we at least get a, a conversation in play that puts us on the road to it? And, and we're still not coming to it. So I just I just do not see how it's how it's mean bad Hamas's fault on that situation. I, I just don't see it. You know what I mean? I think that at the end of the day, I feel like the most generous take is that you can say Netanyahu and the IDF, everyone at top brass is just saying, hey, we are willing to sacrifice these people for this goal, for this this goal of saying, hey, we are going to get the hostages back. We, we are willing to do this. And, um, you know, we want to have this, this total victory that uh, Netanyahu kind of keeps fucking pumping, which is, I, I think he said in Rafa, there's like um, some Hamas, like, uh, I forget the word that was used, but like regiments or something like that, battalion, something. And essentially he's saying like, oh, well, we can like, push and get them. And and it's almost like they're doing the thing where they kind of keep putting the carrot of like, oh, we're just almost there. Just like one more push, one more big act. And it's just another big act and another big thing. And it's like, y'all have heard me talk about this shit now since October. Like, I just, I do not believe anything that Netanyahu is saying. I don't believe any of the shit at all. Um... So and I also don't believe Biden when he's like they have this like wording of like, well, you know, Biden has told uh, Netanyahu like, hey, you guys can't do anything unless you actually provide a solution for the for the civilians. Knowing good and damn well, there is none in the situation without once again, a goddamn ceasefire. So like what what is, what is this conversation? What is the diplomacy at hand? I think there's been some like side news where they, they try to say, ooh, and to top it off, Biden called him a bad name. I don't give a fucking shit what old Joe said. It's, it's about what he's not doing. So, you know, I mean, here we are. I, 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 I want to take it back to the top of the conversation, which is saying, hey, I'm glad that these two men are, are back with their families and that they're safe. I think that is a good thing. I don't want to stress that. And I can't stress that enough. It, it just, it shouldn't have come at the cost of, of what it came in just this situation alone. Um, another side story that I kind of had picked up, um, there was a, a tank that, uh, an IDF tank that blew up a car full of people. And I'd gotten some details on the story and I'd kind of saw it, you know, kind of doing my research and, you know, seeing that on like CNN tickers or whatever. But they had finally were able to get to the girl that had made a 911 call um, from the car. And um, I mean, you have to say there was nothing that, you know, any of the, the UN workers could do. Um, but it was sad to know that they literally like were able to see and witness this. But there's nothing they could do because at the end of the day, Israel said, you cannot go into this area. If you go into this area to do anything, we will treat you like a combatant. We'll blow you up. So... It's just like, what do you do? And there's so many stories like that, you know? I, I could spend all damn night, I could revert my whole podcast just to this conflict, just to the shit like that. And, um, you know, I still wouldn't do it justice. And, um, you know, that, that, shit, that shit is the most heartbreaking thing for me. But that's why I always got to keep coming back to this shit. And, um, you know, if you're a listener, I'm, I got to bring you along with me. You know what I mean? Uh, you got to walk, walk, you got to walk with me. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's, let's move on to the next thing though, from the Associated Press, what to know about a shooting at Joel Osteen's mech church, a shooter's motive for opening fire in a celebrity pastor, Joel Osteen's mega church remain unclear Monday as authorities search the suspect's home in suburban Houston and identified the weapon used in the attack as an AR style rifle. The house in Conroe, Texas, is more than 50 miles or 80 kilometers north of Lake Woods Church, where Sunday shooting in between busy services sent worshipers 
scrambling, scrambling to find safety. The shooter was identified as 36-year-old Janice Yvonne Marino, according to an affidavit seeking a search warrant released by the Montgomery County District uh, Attorney's Office. Police say Marino was shot and killed by two off-duty officers working security at the church, one of the largest megachurches in the U.S. I also like that even the AP does uh, the homework of reminding you that this was the same church that, like, denied people who were, like, looking for shelter in a hurricane. They're like, yeah, we just can't let you in. Sorry. You're just going to have to wait it out outside. Sorry. <laughs> um, but let's see. Obviously, to the, you know, the, the, the moment at hand. Two other people were shot and wounded, including the shooter's young son, who entered the church with them. Here's what to know about the shooting. Um, I'm going to just go straight to my highlighted part. Finner said the shooter entered the church with the young boy, but did not describe their relationship. The suspect began shooting and was confronted by two off-duty officers, a Houston police officer and an agent with the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission who returned fire. Before being shot and killed, the suspect told officers that they had a bomb and were carrying a yellow color or yellow and color rope and substance and substances consistent with the manufacture of explosive devices, which appeared to be a detonation cord. According to the search warrant affidavit, Finner said Sunday that the a search warrant found no explosives. Uh, let's see here. Um, Marino's son, whose authorities described as a seven-year-old, was shot in the head and remained in critical condition Monday. The boy was initially described Sunday as a five-year-old. It is unclear how who um, is unclear how the boy who was taken to Houston's Children's Hospital was struck by gunfire. When asked whether the boy was shot by one of the off-duty officers returning fire on the suspect, Finner said he did not want to speculate, but added that the suspect put that baby in danger. <laughs> it's all on that lady, okay? It doesn't matter where the bullets went, all right? We're heroes. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? Fuck it. I'll give it to you. At the end of the day, you were the guy with the gun. You were the hero with the gun in the situation. But, I mean, it looks like you've critically injured a boy in the process. I mean, I, I guess that's, you know, the kind of the same things that, uh, you know, Spider-Man has to deal with. I don't fucking know. Um, let's see here. Um, I think there was another person who was injured, but, uh, they're apparently missing that, uh, at least in this part. Um, I, I know, and I actually kind of appreciate, I know I slam a lot of, um, media outlets, you know, when I'm, I'm getting the shit and I feel like I'm just fine doing so, but, um, a lot of places are talking about, um, what was on the gun. Uh, some of her anti-Semitic writings and things of that nature. And and then they're painting this as like, oh, pro-Palestinian shooter kills, blah, blah, you know, uh, wounds, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, look, I get it because this is just something that we do um, you know, when it, I think it was Dylan Roof in that shooting, you know, you're going to talk about all the fucking shit that he was adoring with and he was talking about and, and shit that he was spouting. I understand. Um, but I think in the, in this kind of situation, especially it's definitely way more about the mental illness at play here because nothing here, nothing about what this person did is anything that's going to change or affect anything that's going on between Israel and Palestine or any of the world's ills. This is just someone who says, hey, I have a problem and I have a gun, so I'm going to solve it with these, with, with that. With, and it's like, no, 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 no way. And, um, you know, apparently they have these writings and all that. Um, I, I didn't get a chance to really look at them, nor do I think I really want to. Um, but, yeah, I mean, obviously that's an, an unfortunate fucking thing. But I, I cannot stress enough that for me personally, I feel like access is the, the biggest fucking thing problem that we have as americans we just have so much access to this kind of shit and every tom dick and harry and claudine can just fucking pick up a gun and use it today um but hey i mean i, I really do hope that at least in, you know for the kid um anyone else who was you know wounded affected by this hopefully you know you see you know a turnaround a recovery um Obviously, it is a very horrific scene to have to, you know, put anyone through. I mean, yeah, I'm clowning on the megachurch for being a fucking megachurch and all that other shit, but it doesn't matter. Like, at the end of the day, it's still it's just as horrific if it's, like, a Baptist church, you know, once again, referencing the Dylan Roof thing. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, I, I'm obviously going to give this coverage, and I and that's why I wanted to add the whole part about the whole anti-Semitism bit, because I know that people are going to be spending this to be like, see? Like, this is why you have to fight this movement. These terrorists are growing everywhere. They're just trying to pop up and say whatever, blah, blah, blah. I guarantee this is all on social, leftist social media, blah, 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 blah. It, it's, it's always some variation of that when when they get the opportunity when it's not some right wing nut job but i will guarantee you and i will sum it up this way they're all people who have mental health issues and just way too much access to firearms and you can work on both of those things um but more times than not the conversation is is just like hey let's just talk about mental health until we forget and um and then we forget so, I mean, on that note, I think I'm ready to move on. I feel like I covered this. Also, fuck Joel Osteen. Tomato, 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 tomato. And, um, yeah, we'll move on. Next beat. Uh, BBC. Trinidad and Tobago hit by mystery ship oil spill. Trinidad and Tobago is considering declaring a national emergency over a huge spill from a ship that ran aground and overturned this week. At least 15 kilometers or nine miles, love that we got to switch it up, you know, international, of Tobago's southwestern coast have been affected, including some of its Car uh, Caribbean islands, pristine beaches. Some 1,000 volunteers have now joined the government's staff to help clean up the spill. Divers have been trying to isolate the leak from the vessel, which has been abandoned by its crew. Farley Augustine, the chief secretary of the island of Tobago, uh, Tobago, on Sun on Saturday, said the government may designate the accident uh, a level three disaster, the highest. Everything indicates that we are going in that direction. He quoted by saying, um, he quoted as, or he was quoted as saying by the AFP news agency. Uh, let's see. The spill is currently level two, meaning the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management believes that the country can deal with that spill, with the spill. Now, this is a part that I find a little bit eerie. Um, the ship, identified only as the Gulfstream, capsized last Wednesday off the coast of the Cove Eco Industrial Estate. Now, no calls were made, and also, no one has claimed ownership of the ship. Like they haven't either said who it is or they don't. They don't know, and that part is weird to me because how is it that you have the ability to know what the name of the ship is, right? Like, shouldn't shouldn't this be, all this information be on file somewhere, like a car or something. I mean, I'm dumb. I don't know maritime shit at all. So, I mean, if you are a listener and you happen to know this shit, please, like, email me or, like, uh, like comment or something. Tell me what's up. Tell me, Educate me so I can educate the people. Because that to me is weird that you can't just, like, it's not all the information, just all in some place. Like, whose big ship does this belong to? Um... But yeah, I, I definitely feel like that's important because it sounds like these guys are causing a fucking, you know, natural disaster or, I mean, unnatural disaster, right? Or they're, they're causing a disaster. <laughs> let, me, let me just cut off the adjectives. Um, you know, uh, and it's sad. I mean, the, these, these kind of things not only, you know, devastate the people of it, but the whole environment, the animals, all the fucking shit, completely disrupted. You know, that it causes death on a mass scale that way. Um, but on the subject of the people... Uh, the, the incident happened just days before Trinidad and Tobago's carnival celebrations, which are an important source of income for its economy. So, I mean, this can be just completely devastating. Once again, not just to the ecosystem, but to the people who live here. Like, you're going to have tourists come and be like, oh, this is just so icky. Like, oh, it's so gross. Like, no one's shaking ass or anything. It's just a bunch of oil. Ew. And then they leave. And that's not good because then they might not come back and they're going to tell a bad story. Maybe more people, instead of um, wanting to come to Trinidad and Tobago for the festivities, they're going to just say, mm, I don't want to go and then be covered in oil. That sounds icky you know there's not enough dawn for me like you know oh, that's gross um that was a, a bad soap joke anyway um yeah we'll call it covered there <laughs> we have one more thing to, to talk about and then i'll let you go the yap session will be over soon uh, but you know what that means i gotta take my last break i have some technical difficulties bear with me boom 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 and we're back. Ooh. 
Ooh, ooh, chow. All right. Our last story comes from the Los Angeles Times. Couples who couple whose gender reveal sparked the massive El Dorado fire sentenced. The couple whose pyrotechnics during a gender reveal party set off what came to be known as the massive El Dorado fire in San Bernardino County in 2020 was sentenced Friday after reaching a plea deal with prosecutors. The couple inadvertently started the 22,000 acre fire on a scorching hot day in the Yucaipa U- 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 Park with a device that was supposed to emit blue or pink smoke, authorities said. The fire killed U.S. Forest, um, Forest Service Wildland firefighters, firefighter, I'm sorry, Charles Morton, injured two more firefighters and 13 others, destroyed five homes and forced other hundreds to evacuate. Uh, Re- Ref- Refugo Manuel Jimenez Jr. was sentenced to a year in county jail, two years of felony probation, and community service after pleading guilty to a felony count of involuntary mail- manslaughter in Morton's death and two felony counts of recklessly causing fire to an inhabited structure, according to the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office. Angela Jimenez pleaded guilty to three misdemeanor counts of recklessly causing a fire to another person's property and was sentenced to a year summary probation and community service, prosecutors said. The Jimenez's were also ordered to pay victims restitution in the amount of 1000 or no way, right? Oh my God, no way. I mean, obviously, you're not going to be able to afford this. I'm, I'm reading the number out loud kind of just threw me off. Uh, $1,789,972. So yes, aka they're going to be paying out for the rest of their lives, which I mean, I get someone died here. Like I, I understand why this is such a big number um and hence why they're not getting like the worst amount of jail time because it's like hey you gotta get back out there you know capitalism's calling baby um resolving this case uh was never going to be a win said san bernardino county uh district attorney jason anderson in a statement to the victims who lost so much including their homes with valuables and memories we understand those are intangibles uh those are intangibles can never be replaced our hope with this restitution is that the it closes a painful chapter in your lives, and the restitution provides a measure of assistance in becoming whole again. Um. So yeah, I I person for the life of me, I can't. I don't think I covered this because I feel like podcast started, I believe, in twenty one. So I don't think we did. But this story is is so familiar to me because we've covered a, at least a few of these stories. Um. So, you know, if this is an update, obviously cool. Happy to kind of close the chapter on that. Um, but, you know, if not, it's a new story. I mean, or if it's just new to you because you weren't listening back then, well, then there you go. Hopefully I, I did it enough justice. But, um, you know, like I said, this isn't our first rodeo. It's not our first time covering a situation like this. I, I really hope that people stop doing audacious um, you know, gender reveals, but I doubt that they will. I think it's just, um, you know, it's the human nature to kind of keep getting bigger and better. And, and if you have the money, you want to, you know, flaunt it and, and you just don't think about consequences. You know what I mean? You just think you're doing something cool. You saw it in a Tumblr post or something and it, it was so fucking cool. Or even if, if you saw people making fun of it and you just liked it or was like, I can top that somehow. I want to be a bigger jackass then you're gonna, because that's just what people do. And I don't even want to say it like it's an American thing. I think this is just a human being thing. Um, You know, it's like, hey, man, we're about to have some spawn, and I want the world to know. I want to Lion King this fucking shit. I want to put this baby on the top of a mountain, and I want to scream out to the world, it's a boy, it's a boy with a penis. I, I don't know. I, I really don't get these kind of feelings personally. Um, I would just rather move in silence. I mean, shit, that's my burden to bear. I have a child. <laughs> I'm with child. Um, but hey, I mean, I'm not dealing with that. I don't I don't have kids. I don't fucking know. It's all Greek to me, baby. All right. But that's it. That's that's the episode. 
Um, if you'd like to help out, if you'd like to support the effort, you can become a newsie today. I do have a Patreon, patreon.com slash Isaiah News. Um, at the top of the month, I shout you out. That's for all my newsies. And uh, plug a project if you like. Free, uh, free ways to hit me up. I mentioned the email earlier, IsaiahNews1 at gmail.com. Uh, like I said, send feedback, questions, comments, concerns. Uh, other ways you can do that, feel free to follow me or the podcast there uh, on the socials. Um, I guess you can't follow me on Yahoo Mail but or, or Gmail, whatever. You really can't do that. It's not that kind of thing. But um, you can do that on Facebook. You can do that on Twitter. I will say, if you send me a friend request, I, I don't. if I don't know you, then I'm probably not going to add you. I don't know. That'd be weird. But you can follow me. You can send. You, you can weirdly send me a personal message, and I'll probably answer it because I'm weird, and I like talking about news. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. Um, I have a YouTube if you're listening on YouTube, hi, hi, what's up? What's how you doing? How you doing? Hopefully you're good. You look great. Um, subscribe if you haven't. That that would really make my day. Leave a cool comment there, a thumbs up there. Um, share that shit from whatever platform. It, it means a lot. It really does mean the world. And and really the best thing you're doing is right here, right now. You've listened. You've made it this far. Twenty six minutes and counting. That's crazy. You're crazy. You're mental, bruv. Um, I love you for that, though. And uh, hopefully I see you soon for some more good news. I love you. Bye-bye. Mwah.